and uh, I've known him in, in Twitter. I haven't, haven't met him in, in, in person, so it, it's a pleasure to finally yeah, see him him. a face without the stop and the say in front of him. So, thank I you may be a little opinionated on Twitter, that's true. No, don't worry, we, we, all, we all are. That, that's what they're for. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's yours. Pues antes de nada quería agradecerles de que me han invitado para acá. Este, siempre quiero venir and finally I got my chance to come to Puerto Rico and hopefully I'll be here again next year. For me. So, it's a little bit different. I'm from Texas. My wife is from Mexico. So that has been an eye-opening experience the last couple of days with all the different terms between Mexican Spanish and Puerto Rican Spanish. <laughs> uh, but in any case, okay, so moving on. Um, today we're going to talk about threat intelligence without FUD, without marketing buzzwords, without vendor pitches. This is, so I do incident response and threat intel in support of incident response. And this is kind of coming from that side. <coughs> Folks who have a military or intelligence community background, most all of this stuff will be old hat. This is more of an intro to how you go about doing this. For those of us who are kind of on the forensics and IR side, we're going to talk about different types of threat intel based on their type, on their source, on what you use them for, some ideas about how to organize it, or ideas about how to analyze and share what you learn. We'll talk a little bit about tools, not too much, but mostly analytic frameworks and uh, a few things along those lines. Before I get started, um, I'm here on my own, I'm not representing, I'm not here for my work. So any opinions that I have are my own, you can't, don't get mad at anybody. If I say something dumb, that's on me, in other words. Uh, and yeah, please don't complain to my boss, it's not that. The, the, I have given a version of this talk for my company, so that, you know they know what's going on, but it's not a big deal either way. Okay, so let's get started. First, you gotta understand, we're gonna use an example through the whole thing. Um, <laughs> For those of you who pay a little bit of attention to some of the companies and so forth that work in this space, the nomenclature may sound familiar, but we're going to use the example of an adversary group we'll call Pissed Off Penguin. We're going to assume that this is a group that targets the South American fishing industry for herring because they're based on the Ross Ice Shelf in Antarctica, and we're, as we go through we'll use them kind of as an example of how we would think about some of these things. Okay, so first we're gonna go through some basic terminology, some taxonomy, that's important to understand as kind of foundational concepts as we go through it. <coughs> so the first thing is to understand the difference between strategic, operational, and tactical intelligence. These terms get used a lot and if you ever have to, and I'm really sorry if you do, have to work with the business intelligence folks in your organizations, they use operational intel completely wrong. Don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. They're just doing their data warehouse stuff, and it's fine. You can think of this as a continuum. These are not discrete buckets necessarily. At the top, when we talk about strategic intel, we're talking about the who and the why. Who is pissed off penguin and why do they care about fish? Well, they care about fish because for them, herring is very yummy. Trends, categories. Um, in my day job, I'm one of the contributing authors, authors to the uh, uh, data breach investigations report. That would be an example of very high level, right, strategic intel. Um, almost so high level as to be abstract, right? When you start moving into operational intel, now we're talking about campaigns, specific operations, specific incidents. Um, tactical intel, or what we think of when we talk about indicators, uh, TTPs, which are tactics, techniques, and procedures. TTPs don't actually include tools in them, despite some vendors liking to throw that term in there. Um, so, for example, if you saw Sarah's talk a few minutes ago, she does a little bit of malware RE, and she says, okay, this is how we can identify this particular piece of malware in the future. That would be tactical intel. But when she said, hey, the Dalai Lama gets targeted, you can 
probably figure out who would be interested in targeting him and so forth. That's strategic and operational would be you know, specific campaign and specific ways they're going about doing that. So when you see these terms, think of it as the operational kind of coordinates the high-level strategic stuff with the kind of day-to-day -day tactical stuff. There's another term that gets used that for those of us from a certain background may be a little bit confusing because it's used in a different way. When you hear talk about open source intelligence, open source monitoring, it does not mean open source in the Free Software Foundation, GNU Pub General Public License kind of way. Um, even though, now to be fair, I am a bit of a GPL zealot, but that's not what open source monitoring means here. In this case, open sources are sources of information that are basically publicly available, that anybody can get. You don't have to have some kind of secret special access to get. So, Contagio that was mentioned earlier is an open source. The New York Times is an open source. Mining Twitter and Pastebin is an open source. Alien Vault provides information and malware that they needed to buy a couple of vowels. They, they are open sources. Closed source information is information that is not generally available. It might be information you develop yourself internally from your own logs or from your own incidents. It might be information that's shared with you privately by people in other organizations. Um, it might be information that's provided to you by a government or similar. This is what we mean when we talk about closed source intelligence. There is a guy named David Bianco who works, I guess he's at Fire Ant, I mean FireEye. Uh, and he has this great concept that I really like. He's a really smart guy, even if he does work there. <laughs> called the, the Pyramid of Pain. And I love to say it because it sounds like some kind of wrestling term. Like, you know, <laughs> cage match, two guys enter, one man leaves. The, the Pyramid of Pain is the concept that the lower in the pyramid, it's easier for you as an incident responder or as an intel analyst to get that information. It's also much easier for your adversary to change that. Okay, so file hashes are trivial to identify. You get a piece of malware, you run your hash on it, and you have it, and that's super easy to get, right? It's also really easy for the adversary in the future to recompile with anything changed almost at all. It flips a bit, and now half of the bits flip, and you see some, a completely different hash. As you move up the pyramid, it gets slightly more difficult to acquire that information, and also just slightly more difficult for the adversary to change it. IP addresses, when they get revealed, right, the adversary can move to a new, let's say, command and control infrastructure, or to new domains to change where, uh, uh, where they serve the stuff from. We talk about, say, artifacts, so when a malware reverse engineer or a network forensics guy like me um, determines this is what the traffic looks like on the uh, going across the wire. This is the persistence mechanism that gets used on the host. Those things can be changed, but now it takes a little more work because they kind of have to re-engineer or re-figure out how they're going to work. As you ascend this pyramid of pain, now you get, it is a lot more difficult typically to identify the specific TTPs for a particular adversary. But once you do, that's their whole way of going about things. It's much more challenging than for them to, to change how that works. All right, let's move to kind of how we're gonna structure the rest of the talk, which is, this is kind of the canonical intelligence cycle. Now to be clear, this is not a truly kind of a waterfall process. These are, you can think of each of these as kind of loops that are constantly processing. Direction is always going on. Collection is constantly happening. Processing, analysis. But they do feed back and forth to each other. Um, it's not entirely unlike, so for those of you that, for those of you who do have a military background or 
just like me, have been working around these people for a long time. There's something called the UDA loop, right? Which is observe, orient, decide, act. It's not entirely unlike that, that you're trying to figure out what's going on, decide what you're going to do, and then do something about it. In this case, that something is analysis. You provide this information to somebody who's then going to go do whatever they're going to do. So what does this mean? When we talk about, first of all, direction, for your threat and tail program, the first thing you got to figure out is what are we trying to do here because that's going to drive everything else. Your goals in one organization may be different from my goals in my organization and it may be different from her goals in her organization. Um, what's it, what are you trying to do? What are your goals? Who's going to receive the intelligence? This is really important because a lot of times I've had clients and colleagues talk about working with Threat Intel and I said that's fantastic if you've gotten to that point in your organization's maturity where you're ready to do that. So who are you going to send it to and what are they going to do with it? And they say, what are you talking about? <laughs> We're going to do Threat Intel so we can stop the bad guys. Not how it works. <laughs> it might be that your goal is to keep your CSO and, and the executive suite informed about current threats to your organization. You're going to drive your program in one direction. It might be that your goal is to enable your incident responders and, and hunters to find incidents within your organization. You're going to go in a different direction. There's a couple of different ways that it can go. So in my case, for the last few years, I've supported external facing incident response teams that go out and do incident response for other clients. So our threat intelligence has yet a different focus, right? So identify who's going to consume the intelligence, what they're wanting to do with it, and so what do they need? You have to have this before you can design anything else in that cycle. Next, collection. This is where we, as, as so those of, most of us in the room, I'm going to take a guess and say are self-described geeks. This is where the this is where the fun part for me is. The direction stuff is boring because it's all that management BS, and all I want to do is start playing with data. Yes. So as important as the first part is, this is where the fun starts. So first of all. Don't immediately start going out and saying, okay, what feeds can I get and what data am I going to scrape? You already have your most valuable threat intel in your organization. You just don't know it yet. Because the best source of threat intel are your existing case reporting, your existing caseload. Theoretically, right, you've already been aware that you've had hopefully nothing major, but maybe you have, certainly a bunch of lower level types of incidents. Maybe a secretary got some malware on his machine, maybe an executive knows that she got fished and this was a problem. So you're going to start by looking there because all this other stuff that's out of the, in the universe and on the internet may or may not be relevant to you, but if it's on your network and on your systems, it's already relevant to you. You know for sure this is a threat we are facing. You may or may not decide it's the biggest threat you're facing, but you know you have it today. So, what sorts of things do you already know about? Based on that, what other st what stuff do you want to know more about? Once you've kind of gotten that in shape, kind of gotten it organized, okay, we have all of our incidents reported into a central case reporting system and everybody who's appropriate, like incident responders and so forth, can all see this information there. Now you can start to say, how are we going to expand out the information that we collect? So, in particular, what information do you already have access to? Well, okay, now you start to think about internally, you've got logs that can be minded. Not just the logs that you think of. We're not just talking firewall logs. Think about DNS logs. Think about your external, you know, if you're using Outlook Web Access, whatever your email is, external facing email, VPN logs, and they have IP addresses associated with them, that's lower level stuff. If you know that in your in, in, uh, industry sector, 
or in your agency or what have you, these are the types of organizational adversaries. And here I don't necessarily mean in a, in a network perspective, but if you're an oil company, right, you've got a couple of different, you've got your competitors, you've got maybe activists, you've got maybe foreign governments. If you're an activist, right, you start to think about, okay, my adversaries might be organized crime, they might be corrupt governments in other places, um, those sorts of things. So you've got to identify your threat model and start to say, what information is relevant to me that I can start to pull in? This whole time, you've got to start thinking about storage. Now, this doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to start putting in a fiber sand with dual connections everywhere and all of that. You, you know, disks these days are relatively cheap, right? Um, open source software, now in, the, in, in kind of our sense, as it were, right? Open source software for a lot of this stuff is freely available. So you can think about, you know, log management or a wiki for um, some of the higher level stuff, those sorts of things. Um, I'm not going to talk about the cloud, the cloud, but you can think about their stuff that's there and available as well. All right. Now, we get to the next phase, which is processing. Processing is not analysis, but there is some very limited automated analysis-like tasks that you can do. So, for example, enrichment. You get an IP address, you can immediately say, okay, we know that this IP address, we can do in a, in a script or something, this is the AS number that it's associated with, this is the, so that organization, it's, you know, possibly got a little bit of geolocation data associated with it. You can do DNS lookups to see what other names are on that system, vice versa. If you have a name, you can get who is data, you can do DNS resolution, that sort of enrichment of associating these other pieces of data with the information that you have, you're going to do that in an automated way because it's kind of boring to do all that stuff manually. It sounds like the first one or two you do, you're like, man, I'm finding stuff out. Oh, I know who this guy is now. And then you realize, I have 500,000 more to do. No, you want to script that shit. Because that is, <laughs> computers like repetitive, boring tasks. That's not what you're, we are best at as, as humans, okay? You want to start thinking at this point as you're starting to do the, your initial, you have this data coming in uh, when you can, establishing some confidence around it. So, for example, we talked about internal threat information. You theoretically, depending on your, the personnel at your location, um, <laughs> have a lot of confidence in the information that you develop in your case reports, right? You have an internal forensic report that's written up by one of your analysts. You, I hope that you can say, we are pretty damn sure that this is right. This is what happened, these are the indicators, you know, they've done everything where they've got their I's dotted and their T's crossed and everything is good. Information you get from, let's say, a, a shared trusted group, fight club, whatever, um, you might not have quite as much confidence in, or you might have more depending on where it's coming from. Um, but you have a still, it's not just random information you downloaded off of some list of IP addresses that somebody tweeted about, right? Um, and then as you do start pulling in feeds, whether that's tactical stuff or that that's more operational stuff, you're going to start to think about how much confidence do I have in this source? How, and confidence doesn't just mean how accurate they are, but also how relevant that is to you and understanding how they generated that information. So as much as I love my SANS colleagues, SANS has a, a, a feed of um, bad IP addresses. It's pretty low confidence because of the way the data is gathered, right? This is just, oh, these are people who shared their logs to us that they got scanned from this IP address. Well, okay, set up a couple of, you know, listeners on any um, ISP in the world and you're going to get similar types of information, okay? When you get that same type of information, though, from your colleague at another similar organization that said, hey, we just had some systems pop and these are the um, exfiltration addresses that that information that our data got sent out to. Now you can be like, okay, this is a little bit higher confidence because it's relevant, it's timely, 
and I can trust to some degree the source, right? Then you can do a lot of, you can start to do a lot of kind of cooler processing tests, which are kind of my, this is where I kind of get into my bread and butter. So mining passive DNS data, um, applying statistical inference rules to recognize TTPs and incident patterns. You can start doing some stuff with machine learning, and this is where I kind of get geeked out. This, I could just spend all day just talking about just this slide, and I don't mean the coffee on it. <laughs> well, I could do that too, but. Okay, now you also need to think in this case about scalability. In other words, as you start doing all these DNS lookups, as you start to trying to do all these correlations between how many different lists did this address show up on, or this threat actor, this is the information we have on, on their social media addresses and so forth. I'm gonna go find out everything I can about this Twitter handle. Now, you start to have some, this is where, okay, maybe you don't need that fiber sand, but you know, that old retired desktop that's running Linux under your desk may no longer be adequate for some of the things that you're dealing with. Data growth is gonna happen more quickly than you probably expect. So think about how you're gonna search your data. Think about what data you actually care about keeping. Um, filters, indexes, think about caching. Think about keeping the data close to where it's gonna be used because I can say that personally, I've more than once I've had a network engineer come angrily bang on my desk telling me that my logs were saturating links between two sites because I was pulling down everything and that was causing problems. I needed to cache stuff there, boil it down a little bit, and then send it back. This sort of scalability is really important when you start pulling in tactical information externally. It doesn't matter as much if you're focused on strategic and operational intel because you're gonna have a lot less noise, it's a lot smaller sets of data from an information theoretical perspective, right? Okay, now we get to the other fun stuff, which is the analysis. Now, people have to understand that analysis means you have people doing the work, right? And this means you can model an analyst as a function that ingests caffeine and data and outputs knowledge. There are a number of different ways, we're going to talk about a few of them, that this sort of thing will be how you can engage this. But keep in mind, all the stuff we did before, all of that process, all that automated stuff, was not intended in any way to replace an analyst. It's intended to make the analyst better at their job, to give them better and more useful information. There are a number of frameworks, and here when I say framework, I don't mean the software perspective, I mean in the analytic perspective, right? So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Veris. There's something else out there called the Diamond Model for intrusion analysis. Uh, the Diamond Model is uh, uh, really fantastic for kind of modeling in your head the different components of an incident. You could think, again, depending on what you're doing, social network analysis techniques. So you say, hey, we know that this Twitter account threatened to DDoS against us. Now, what other Twitter accounts are connected to that? What, ha what URLs have they mentioned? Oh, look, here's an associated Pastebin account. Here's an associated Facebook page. And you start pulling this. Those sorts of social network analysis techniques here start to play into what your analysts can do. However, as you're going through these things, you want to be aware of what are called cognitive biases. When we say cognitive biases, we mean that we tend to think in certain ways because we're human. And that's okay, but we have to be aware of them and kind of uh, try to take steps to factor that out. So here's an, an obvious one might be um, something called confirmation bias, which is that we tend, as humans, to believe a little bit more information that confirms what we already suspect, and information that goes against what we suspect, we tend to kind of discard a little bit. We have to be aware of that, 
because it may well be that her initial suspicion is incorrect. Um, there are techniques that you use to deal with this analysis of competing hypotheses, which as complex as it sounds just means you kind of make a list of all the different things that could explain it, and you start trying to figure out ways to eliminate, to falsify, to disprove each of those hypotheses. There's a fantastic book that's freely available because it was written by a, a senior guy at the CIA um, and is available for free at CIA.gov called The Psychology of Intelligence Analysis. And all it really is is going through and talking about some of the ways that um, some of these sorts of things you need to be aware of. Two other books that are super useful. I don't have anything to do with the authors. I'm, I don't, I'm there. I know I should probably do that here as well. <laughs> No, I really, I do know how to use computers, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Two other books, again, there's no affiliate links, anything like that. They're just really, I, I personally have benefited a lot from them. Are the Analyst Cookbook, I put the name back down here as well because it's hard to see, read up there the way it's printed, and Challenges in Intelligence Analysis. These are not specific to anything related to information security, right? These are... <clears throat> broader, but the concepts still apply. <clears throat> and the analyst cookbook goes through a different number of ways mentally that you might do some of these things. So you think about, okay, the sorts of things you, you know, our moms taught us, you know, listing pros and cons, mm -hmm. right? That would be like the very first thing. But then you get into Delphi analysis, you get into workshopping and, and mind mapping and a number of different analytic techniques. It's really well done. Challenges in Intelligence Analysis goes through a number of historical cases, case studies of what was known, how information was gathered, how it was analyzed, and what was done with that. Historically, we're talking about from um, everything from recent things involving uh, uh, Al-Qaeda or some of the, the Falun Gong and some of Rio uh, cults in, in East Asia, to ancient history, you know, what happened with the 12 Israelite spies that went into Canaan in the Bible. It spans that whole thing. Julius Caesar is an example in here for his conquest of Gaul. So it's, it's a set of historical perspectives on how to go about this. <coughs> Something else that is useful that is more, uh, I guess, timely in some sense, more specific to what we do, is something called the Verus Framework. The VARIS framework stands for the vocabulary for event recording and, and incident sharing. It's open source in every sense of the term. Right? You can go to VARIScommunity.net and get it. The, the VARIS framework is designed to help you, to give you a way of thinking about modeling an incident that happened. So in VARIS, we model an incident as a series of events. And each of those events has four A's associated with it. The actor, who did it. The action, what did they do. The asset, what they did it to. And the attribute, what happened to the thing that got affected. So, very quickly, the way you might think of this is, let's say that you have an executive gets a phishing email. She clicks on it, gets an exploit that roots your system and sends out information out to a, to a data exfiltration server. You're going to model that through a couple of different events because first there was a social event, right, where she was convinced to click on the link. Then there was a malware event, or actually in this case be a hacking event, where there was a vulnerability that was exploited to install some piece of malware and then the malware did something on the system and exfiltrated the data back out. So you've got two or three different events within this. There are a number of specific enumerations, examples, documentation there. If you want to use this programmatically, you certainly can. So you can incorporate it to your case management systems or whatever else. This, by the way, is the analysis framework that we use to write the data breach investigations report every year. But there are other organizations that use it internally. 
Um, you can get all the JSON schemas and all of that on GitHub. It's all linked from there at VarusCommunity.net. I use it as well for my own research in terms of, there's something called the Varus Community Database, which is we have thousands of publicly disclosed incidents analyzed using the Varus framework, made available in JSON so that researchers like us can then go analyze that data and say, what do all hacktivist incidents, what, do, what trends do we see within those? Or um, what are the top industries that are targeted by SQL injection? Those sorts of questions you can answer from, from that database. Something else that's important, as you're doing this analysis, what you're doing is you're kind of trying to go down a, a path Really, I promise I don't have to use computer. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah, you wouldn't be convinced right now. Is that you're trying to go down this, this path here. You, you pull in a lot of data, just raw information, and from that you want to develop some sort of knowledge. We can say these things about these adversaries or about these techniques or what have you, and then from that a deeper understanding, which really implies in this case understanding what actions you need to take or awareness you need to have for your organization as you're going through these things, keeping in mind the cognitive biases and the, and the confidence levels and those sorts of things we talked about before. Now, so far, almost everything we've talked about has been in developing information within your organization. When I say organization, it could be you know, your, your corporation, your employer, it could be a government agency, it could be an NGO, it could be you and your friends working on some project that you know is going to have some other folks that are not happy about it, whatever that turns out to be. But it's important sometimes to work with other people that are facing some of the same adversaries, right? If you, you'll notice, banks never compete on security. And by that I mean, of course, they do in the sense that they will talk about how secure they are, and if you use us, you know, we have all these fancy features on our website, and this and that, and we're going to keep your, your account information safe. But what I mean is, let's say a bank gets compromised. You're not going to see the other bank saying, well, clearly you can't trust them. You need to send your money over to us. The reason for that is that banks care about us they want us to trust in the financial system. They want us to, in general, think of banks as secure. Because if, let's, let's say um, retail stores. If, when you hear about a big retail store get compromised, so my wife, who's here this week and is definitely not a nerd, she's, and she's not a security person, when she hears store X got compromised and these credit cards got stolen, she doesn't think I should, should stop shopping there and go over to the store's competitor. She's like, man, this is making me nervous. I'm, I'm going to have to figure out a different way to get the stuff that I want. right? She doesn't necessarily say, I'm going to stop going to Macy's and I'm going to go over to Dillard's or whatever. I don't know where she shops. She brings home clothes for me and says, here, try this on. If you don't like it, I'll take it back. Because <laughs> I'm not going to the store. <laughs> so when she does this, there's a reason that banks, for example, share information among themselves. And the main way, one of the ways that they do that are through technical standards for sharing this information. There is, on the right-hand side, something called Open IOC. Open IOC is a standard that comes from the company now, FireEye, right? And it's for sharing very, very tactical level information about a particular threat. So you can think of it kind of like, not exactly like, an antivirus signature, right? It's going to say maybe look, if you look for this registry key and this process number and this mutex and you see those three things, it means you have this particular piece of malware. If you see this uh, hash on there, and you and you see uh, uh, connecting to this particular system, it's probably this group. Okay, that's OpenIOC. 
And that's all that it just stays kind of at that level. Competing with that, you have this stack that comes, it's produced by MITRE, which is one of those weird federally funded corporations that's semi-public, semi-private. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they over-engineer it. No. I have a lot of friends there. I, I work with them heavily on this standard. Um, and I have a lot of strong opinions about both of these competing sets. And in fact, the main guy who's behind Open Eye is also a friend of mine. So everything I say, I say with love. Um, but here you have this whole stack of protocol. Cybox is more or less, I mean, cyber observable expressions, more or less is parallel with Open IOC. There are a few differences, but they kind of exist at the same level at the, in the stack, right? And that is for capturing that kind of real tactical level detail. STIX, which is Structured Threat Information Expression, incorporates like, I think like nine different kinds of documents. Cybox is one of them, but it also has a section in there for information about a particular threat actor. And information over here about a recommended course of action. And information over here about specific campaigns. And you link them together and you say, Okay, you have these sets of observables that's related to, so you've got 10 different sets of observables that are related to two different um, campaigns, and both of those are attributed to this threat actor, and here's what we know about it. But it's put into a structured format that then I can send that sticks to somebody else, and in fact, if you set up between enough different people, uh, 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 process to share that in a more automated and robust fashion, now you have taxi, which I do not remember what it stands for, but transport <laughs> something something. Um, I have a lot to say, and I don't have a lot of time to say, about these standards. First of all, they suck, but they suck in useful ways. <laughs> and by that I mean that they're not that great, but they're better than sending information in just human written emails, hey, we saw this hash and we think it's related to this, talking to this IP address, and you send that to your buddy at another organization, and well, that's great, but now if somebody has to read it, parse it, figure what they're gonna do with it, versus having it something that can automatically get ingested and processed in some way. The other thing is, and this is a little bit down in the weeds, but it's all XML. Now, for those of you who, like me, have been doing this for a while and have gray in your beard or in your hair, um, XML is old and busted. JSON is the new hotness. XML right? is painful. What's that? XML is painful. Yeah, and, and it's a pain to work with. If you look at a document in either of these, as you open it up in your favorite text editor, which I hope to God is not Emacs, <laughs> Ouch. I felt that. You felt, yeah. Ugh. Anyway, yeah. it's a pain to read. If you pull it up, if you pull up JSON, it's a little bit more easy. It's a little bit easier for a human to read this and kind of parse it mentally. It's also a lot easier to validate for me to validate it and the whole ecosystem around it. As a developer, as a programmer, I much prefer working with JSON. Yes. Okay, that's a little bit down in the weeds, but the reality is that there are. Open IOC is too specific, it's too narrow in scope, Sticks, the whole sticks stack is fantastic in its scope, but holy cow does it stink of MITRE over engineering. That said, nothing else out there today really does what they do, so here's hoping that over time these evolve into more useful ways or more useful methods. So this is where we start to share that information to other folks and, and hopefully uh, you know, start to get some cross-organizational, I'm going to use that MBA word, synergy, going. Yeah. You said no buzzwords. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is I don't know a better word to use for it. There has to be a better one that doesn't sound so douchey. Anyway, um, the, the last piece, this isn't truly a separate phase in the cycle. This really should be happening between every pair of connected phases in the cycle. Is that the feedback should go the other way. So 
when you're collecting data and turning that off for processing, that process, the lessons that you learn about how to process it should inform how you collect that data up here, right? You say, okay, it's really a pain when we get the information like this. What can we do about that further up in the chain? You say, we got this direction from our consumers. Maybe that's our, maybe your consumers are going to be the sysadmins who are going to be running the systems. They say, we need to know this, this, and this. And you say, well, I need you to be more specific, or do you also want these sort of things? That feedback should continually flow back the other way as well. And the idea is that over time, you sharpen your focus and you can see more detail and get more useful information from it as you're doing these things. With that, here's the, here are the core ideas to take away, right? Understand that the terms used in intelligence analysis may not exactly match what those of us who kind of come from the, the geek world, as it were, right? So those of us who are you know, primarily hackers and sysadmins and programmers and whatnot, when we, for example, open source. I remember years ago when I was really a noob, I was in a meeting with my boss and a vendor, and they're like, we do open source monitoring. This was about 2002. Yeah, and I was mad. I thought they meant that they were like, you got to watch out for all those open source programmers because you don't know what they're going to put into your system. And I was like, open source is not a threat, da, da, da. And my boss is just faithful. And he's like, no, they mean like newspapers. Okay, so that's what we're talking about there. The other thing to keep in mind is that as you structure your threat intel program, whatever that turns out to be, you want to both understand what you're going to do with the information how you're going to collect it, what you're going to process with it, how you're going to analyze it, what you're going to do with the result. Is the result going to be law, uh, uh, matching rules in your SIM? Is the result going to be a, a weekly situational awareness meeting with your CSO? Is the result going to be something else? How, what are you going to do with that information and how am I going to share it? And above all, please, 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 Keep in mind that you have to think about this stuff in a structured way for it to be useful and not jump to bad conclusions. When the target breach was first announced very late last year, there were a number of analyses that came out that said, oh, based on this one piece of information, we think the bad guys are these people who did it this way. But because they didn't have a full picture, and they jumped to some conclusions, they saw one connection and immediately assumed that was the connection, they, there were a lot of false reports about who was responsible for what. Uh, other times, people got a piece of sample code, didn't really know how to reverse engineer the code, saw one artifact in it, saw, oh, that's where this Metasploit module from many years ago, and they had nothing to do with each other. It was this really generic thing. And in fact, it was funny. One of these blog posts got pulled within like a day of being posted. The company was like, yeah, we're sorry. That should have gone through our, our validation process. And it didn't. And the guy just put it up on the website. Yeah, you don't want to be that person. Um, I'll be happy, of course, to take questions for the next few minutes before the next speaker. For any questions that I can get to, you think later on, or you just want to chat about some of this stuff, Please feel free to reach it. Twitter is better for me than email, but if it's really private, email me or just say, hey, can you follow me back for a DM? I live on Twitter for those of you who already. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, literally, it is the first, one of the very first things I do when I wake up in the morning is, what came in overnight? <laughs> and before I go to bed, it's like, okay, have I answered everything? It's, I kind of live on it. I work from home. I, I, don't go anywhere, I'm going to have my family there, but kind of Twitter is my connection to the outside world. So that's my, that's how I interact with people. So and with that said, does anybody have any questions, thoughts, comments, anecdotes, recipes? Yes, sir. I have a question regarding uh, your comment about uh, Jason, or rather your uh, statement regarding uh, Jason is uh, more uh, legible for... Uh, for me, it's more readable, yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, if... 
if that's true, then why are, why is that framework using XML rather than Because I didn't write it. <laughs> they didn't listen to me. Okay, to be to be fair, to be absolutely fair, in the in the so for the sticks stack for sticks and Stybox, uh, MITRE has kindly made available some Python libraries to work with their stuff. And when you make that final call to, okay, I've built up this data structure with all this stuff, I want to output it to XML, you can actually output it to JSON instead. It's kind of interchangeable. And here's the dirty little secret. Despite the fact that all of their architecture, they'll tell you it's XML independent or whatever, but it uses XSDs and all of that junk. Um, <laughs> here's the here's this secret that I don't want to tell you. Internally, their implementation of it uses JSON <laughs> in the database. But they make all of us deal with XML, and it makes me mad. Why? Because they hate freedom. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, organizations that are you know related to each other that do not actually share threat data, because we go through that all the time. I work for uh, Sony Network Entertainment, and we go through fraud schemes that Microsoft has gone through. Uh huh. And we actually have to call the game vendor, and game vendor just tells us call Microsoft, and then they're like, they use cables of this. By the way, do you know Sean? Sean. Cut over. Okay, he's an SOE guy in San Diego who... Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. You should talk to him. And I, know it's a diff I know that your company is heavily siloed right. very much, but Sean knows his stuff. You should reach out to him. Okay, that said, yes, not every industry is as well-developed as these things. Um, they're for industries that are designated as critical infrastructure. There are what are called ISACs that are kind of uh, semi governmental semi not that are funded and, and run by that, the folks in those in that industry. There's also one for state and local governments called the MSI SAC. Okay. But not every industry like that, right, is critical infrastructure. So a number of them are trying to, like the retail industry is a good example. They're starting to put together kind of their own type of ISAC like structure. Um, because absolutely, so for example, as a longtime gamer, right, I, I don't choose which game I play based on how good their anti-fraud is, right. right? You're not competing on that stuff. It's in my interest as a consumer for you guys to share all that information with each other so that we're all protected. Um, and gaming in particular is an area where there should be a lot of, of that because you're all dealing with the same things. Um, in those cases, what I suggest is to try to meet individuals and see if you can set up some sort of, you know, kind of underground <laughs> information sharing. Because there are a number of these, I made reference earlier to trust groups. That's kind of what these are. Um, I also call them fight clubs because the first rule of fight clubs, you're talking about fight clubs. And some of them get to be super secret squirrel, and some of them are not as irritating as that. Um, but the thing is, you know, kind of set up some of that. Talk to me offline. I'll put you in contact after this. And I'll talk. Put you in contact with uh, Sean and a few other people that Thank work you. in that sector. Any other questions before Alyssa kicks my ass off of the stage? <laughs> because man, talk about someone's going to keep you awake the whole time. I'm feeling tired today. Feeling tired? <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. I'll be around the rest of the day.